Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. I'm excited to share that we have four demos today from DRAN, NetOps, and Consensus Lab. So we could start with the first on the list, um, Yolan and Patrick. Welcome to our demo. So we'll demo our time lock encryption feature we're bringing uh, using the DRAN uh, Lego Fontropy Network. Uh, that's a um, work of the DRAN team. So together with Patrick, mostly. Maybe briefly, time lock encryption is the capability of being able to encrypt something toward the future. So the ID was initially submitted uh, in 1993 on a cypherpunk mailing list. And that um, at the time, it was that the only way to achieve that was to rely on trusted third parties such as notaries, you know, to which you would give a decryption key seal and they would unseal it when the time has come. Um, since then, the, there has been a lot of research on the topic, but most of the um, solutions were either relying on proof, on proof of work, a bit like Bitcoin and so on, or they needed something such as a trusted third party or a reference clock. And time lock encryption is really interesting because it can help reduce front running, mitigate MEV, and so on. It's also possible to encrypt your Bitcoin private key towards the future let's say in two years, so that if you die, your, um, you know, your um, successors would be able to decrypt it in two years if they got the, the encryption. And if you're still alive, you could just transfer the Bitcoin to a new address and it's not lost, you know. Our solution to achieve time lock encryption is to rely on the existing Egofontropy DRAN network as a reference clock. So the DRAN, um, network that is being run by the Lego Fontropy is made of over 20 nodes or roughly 23 nodes currently run by 16 uh, unrelated parties, including big names such as Cloudflare, Ethereum Foundation, and so on. And um, the nice thing is that DRAND is building on top of, yeah, is building a threshold network, which we can trust. So here we can see how DRAND beacons are mapping to a given time. So each 30 seconds currently, um, the legal entropy is issuing a new round, and this is, you know, perf perfectly deterministic. So we can say in five minutes there will have been ten rounds, and so on. The security of the whole thing is relying on the BLS signature scheme, uh, which Iran uses. And the nice thing with BLS is that it's a pairing-based uh, cryptography uh, crypto system, and that's compatible with identity-based encryption. And we use identity-based encryption to basically say, okay, we use the signature, the DRAN signature in the future as the secret key, and we use the message that is going to be signed in the future as the public key. So anybody knows the message, it's the round number, but you to know the secret key, you need to wait until the network um, issues the, the signature for that round. And so we are building on top of that to achieve a time lock encryption. So we already have a Go client, uh, which is working, and a Go library. So the, the CLI tool, I, I think Patrick can demonstrate it now. Um, so yeah, as Yolan alluded to, we've got a, a Go library, uh, a CLI, with which we can encrypt and decrypt things for the future. Uh, some points to note here, it supports multiple networks. You can input the duration. Uh, you can also fiddle a bit with the output uh, format that you would like. Um, so let's first take some plain text message that we'd like to encrypt. So uh, I guess, hello, protocol labs. Yeah, very simply, the default settings here will use the test net for DRAND uh, to encrypt for us. So let's encrypt our file here. Uh, and let's set a time, I suppose, of five seconds. We can decrypt it nice and easily in a moment. And our output file, we're going to put in decrypted data, which I guess I'll show you that's nice and empty, so no one thinks I'm cheating. Um, and let's input our uh, data of text that we had a moment ago. After a brief second, we'll see now in encrypted data here, uh, we have a payload. Uh, we can also uh, turn that into armor, which um, some of you may recognize from some other schemes, such as PGP. If we are then to decrypt that as well with the CLI, it's also possible. Uh, we pass in uh, our encrypted data and we output it somewhere else. So let's say decrypted data here. 
uh, we're going to pass in our encrypted data and hopefully the output of our decrypted data will be uh, exactly as we hoped. Uh, additionally, hot off the press, in fact, finished earlier today, uh, we've also worked on a, um, a pure TypeScript implementation of time lock encryption. So now you can do this fully in browser as well. So if we copy the, uh, the ciphertext we got over there, hopefully, demo gods willing, uh, we will be able to decrypt that. <laughs> demo gods not willing, it seems. There you go. Uh, however, we can also encrypt and decrypt uh, using, yeah, I need to refresh the cache. Well, that's not. We can also do some encryption and decryption this way around. Hopefully, we will be able to decrypt this using time lock. And let's also clear our decrypted data. That's awkward. Unfortunately, the demo gods have not been kind on this day, but uh, <laughs> very shortly, uh, these two libraries will be compatible and uh, you'll be able to encrypt in one and decrypt in the other. That's all I have on the demo side for now. Yeah, and so the TLE tool is also compatible uh, with, uh, you know, it, it's ju just like PGP, so you can use it to pipe data into, uh, it's, com it's supporting streaming interfaces, so you can pipe data into it, you can pipe it into other uh, commands and so on, so the, the, it should be fairly easy to use. And behind the TLE um, command line tool, there is the TLOC uh, library, which is um, a Go library that you can use in your projects and that allows you to achieve the same functionalities, basically. Um, so the whole thing will be made public next week on the 12th of August for uh, DEF CON, because we have a talk that was accepted there. So uh, by then, the UI uh, should have changed a bit. I can share my screen again. So by then, the, the UI should have changed a bit to look maybe more like that. And uh, the um, library, the JS library and the Go library will both be released. It's currently running on testnet, uh, on the DRUN testnet, but uh, we are planning to launch a new unchained network for DRUN mainnet, uh, for the legal entropy mainnet in September, mid-September. So starting mid-September, you should be able to use time lock encryption in a way that is secure because the test net is like maybe three four parties so it's not super secure as a threshold network the main net instead is a threshold of 13 over 23 nodes so it's fairly secure you need to compromise 13 nodes to be able to decrypt anything earlier which is quite difficult to achieve in practice normally that's it all right um we can move on to the next one thank you guys we have NetOps and Travis Person will be presenting. Let me know when you're ready. Hey everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna be kind of showing some of the work we've done over the last couple of months around uh, improving the snapshot service that I would say most people use uh, in the Falcon community, particularly for, for mainnet. So this has been something that's been going on for a while. This has been originally spearheaded uh, by Reba, who's done an excellent job maintaining the current snapshot solution uh, that I personally use almost weekly for the work that I do. Uh, and now we're kind of taking over the stewardship of this, of this uh, service. Uh, and we recently launched a, a new version of it. Snapshots are a, uh, a way to join into the Filecoin network. So through the Lizard documentation, you can kind of read about this, but basically snapshots are this small segment of the Filecoin chain uh, that contains enough state information to allow nodes to participate in the consensus mechanism that Filecoin uses. Uh, right now, the Filecoin chain is upwards of 16 terabytes in size if you were to compute it from Genesis up until now. Um, in doing so, it's roughly takes about 36 days for every year's worth of, of chain data that's produced. So now we're, you know, we're coming up on uh, two years, right? Uh, so we're coming up, you know, almost 60, 70 days uh, of compute time if we're to reprocess that chain. So that's not something that's realistic for users who are trying to get into the network or if you're trying to restore from a, a, you know, data disaster if you lose your, your data store or whatnot. So chain snapshots enable users to get into the network relatively quickly. Uh, the work that I've done is just to op 
operationalize this in a way that we can have better guarantees around the availability of the snapshots uh, and then also put in alerting and monitoring places so we can understand uh, how these snapshots are, are being produced and how, how well, you know, we're, we're able to keep them being produced on a regular basis. So today we announced uh, that these are in a soft launch phase, uh, providing snapshots for both mainnet and calibration networks. Uh, so just kind of quick overview, kind of what this kind of looks like. Uh, essentially what we do is we produce snapshots every two hours. Uh, we do this through a, a cron job that, that runs. We produce jobs. These jobs then go off and talk to a set of Lotus nodes that we operate and then perform an export of chain data. We take that chain data and then we stream it up into S3 at the moment. That data is then made available to uh, users uh, who can find out the latest snapshot by visiting one of these URLs. These URLs redirect users to the actual snapshot that exists. So in this case, you can see here, if we make a request, so I'm gonna move this toolbar. Uh, if we make a request to the latest calibration snapshot, we get back a redirection to the actual car pile itself. And then if we were to do a curl request here to follow the redirection and then download the attachment here, we'll actually download uh, the car file named car file here. So one of the, the kind of improvements we've made that I've, I, we had some feedback from users that the old snapshot system, uh, it used to use this concept of, of the latest object that actually referenced the snapshot itself, which you can see right here. So if we do this request for this latest object, we'd actually get back the snapshot contents itself. Um, in certain cases, if users had slow download speeds, this can actually end up in corrupted downloads because the actual latest object would change out from underneath users. So instead of directing users to the having this latest represent a snapshot itself, we redirect users to uh, the actual like a static file that represents the snapshot, which then can be downloaded. Lotus automatically handles this. So if you put in these latest URLs into your into your Lotus nodes, uh, Lotus will follow these redirects and download download the file itself. Um, we also support the, the same kind of behaviors. We have SHA checksums so users can, can you know, do a request for a snapshot, can also pull, pull in the SHA sum and then verify the, the file integrity they can download. Um, as I said, we, we provide snapshots for the calibration network now. Uh, this is kind of a new thing. Um, the software we have can run against the network, so we could even provide them for the butterfly network if we wanted to, but due to the constant resets and that be primarily being a development network, it's not something we're necessarily looking to, to provide. Um, usually networks short enough that people can just sync up relatively quickly. So if you want to find more information about this, there's an announcement post in the Filecoin Lotus Help channel at the moment. This links to uh, all this information has some information here links to the, the public notion page. And we also have a your or a uh, pull request open to the Lotus documentation to add a section uh, referencing this new information. Uh, we are looking to this is a soft launch that we're doing, and then we're going to be looking to uh, deprecating the current existing uh, snapshots that are in the file plane chain snapshots fallback bucket. Uh, primarily, this is to give Riva his time back and allow him to go off and do uh, better things. <laughs> um, so hopefully, we'll be able to like you know take over, take this over and provide a, a good service to the community. In terms of some of the improvements, like I said, one of the big things we were looking for is monitoring, having some information. We're still working on this, but at the moment, we have uh, dashboards that we can keep track of the operation of these systems. So, for example, this is the mainnet service or we can see when the last job started, when the next job is being scheduled, then how long since the last job ran. These are the jobs themselves in operation. And this time span is the how long the job to execute. And then we can see that kind of same information here in these graphs showing how long these, these have been running. Along with that, we can see the nodes that these are operating against. The way this is designed is to operate against three nodes or more and it round robins between the nodes as much as it can to allow for the nodes to recover after producing a snapshot and to reduce load on any, any single node. 
so far are we've had pretty good uptime in terms of our our operations everything's relatively normal nominal here um and it's been running for about two weeks in its current deployment thank you we have next andre uh from consensus lab my name is andre i'm a summer phd fellow at consensus lab and in the next few minutes i will show you how you can take a pseudo code from a textbook or a theoretical white paper and convert it to an actual implementation using the MIR framework. And MIR is being developed by the Y3 team, whose Slack avatars you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, the outline is pretty simple. We are going, after a high-level view of MIR, we are going to take a textbook algorithm, convert it, uh, implement it in MIR, and run it. The basic abstraction of MIR is a node. And the node consists of modules, which communicate by exchanging events. These events can also be intercepted and later replayed for debugging purposes, but uh, basically it's just an event loop. And this is the core of MIR, and we want to keep this core as small and simple as possible. And most of the complexity is actually implemented on top of this core. And today I will talk uh, about a specific component uh, called DSL, which stands for Domain Specific Language. And uh, the goal of this component is to provide better abstraction, better programming abstractions, because the core, uh, it provides you with an interface to implement a module, but implementing a module directly, implementing this interface directly, it's akin to writing software in assembly. So there is a natural conflict between keeping the core as simple as possible and uh, providing the user with nice abstractions. That's why we need this extra layer, or, which is the DSL. One of the main goals of DSL and MIR in general is to mimic the way that theoreticians uh, write their pseudocode in textbooks and white papers. This snippet of code is taken from the famous textbook of Christian Cachon, Rashid Garavi, and Louis Rodriguez called Introduction to Reliable and Secure Distributed Programming. So while there is no single universally accepted pseudocode notation, there are some common trends. For example, you don't see people opening TCP connections or marshalling and admarshalling messages in the pseudocode. You are also quite unlikely to see uh, people dealing with mute access and concurrency in general, again, in the pseudocode. So, but what, what you see instead quite often is this error, um, is this event-based paradigm where uh, the protocol is basically represented by a set of event handlers, which are executed one at a time without concurrency. So this way they can access the shared state without any race conditions without any problems. So um, other than normal event handlers, uh, what is quite common to have in the pseudocode is uh, condition handlers. So this handler here is being executed when this condition over here is satisfied. And this is something completely strange to most programming languages. At least I've never seen any similar abstractions in programming languages. So just for the context, I'm going to quickly explain you what this pseudocode does. Um, it actually implements an abstraction called Byzantine Consistent Broadcast. And uh, the goal is for a single node, uh, for the leader, to be able to broadcast a single message to a fixed set of nodes. And uh, it should be able to do so consistently, consistently, which means that a Byzantine leader, a malicious leader, will not be able to send different messages to different nodes. So you can see it as some sort of uh, equivocation prevention mechanism. OK, so let's quickly compare the pseudocode to MIR code and see uh, how they are similar or different. So the code in mid DSL, it starts from this command, from this func function dsl.new model, which creates this handle m, which is sort of representation of our module, which we'll use to register 
handlers. And as for the state, we can simply actually use a local variable. Here is an example of a simple event handler. In the pseudocode, what happens is uh, when the reader wants to broadcast some message, it iterates over the list of all processes and it sends to each process the message. This is the first step of the protocol. And how we implement it in MIR is very similar. We invoke this upon broadcast request function, which registers a handler, handler for the broadcast request event. So the event has some data. Uh, and here we check some condition, which in the pseudocode, we simply could leave a comment that, OK, this handler, it can be only pro invoked by process S, which is the leader. So in the actual code, we probably want to actually check this condition to avoid some silly mistakes. Um, then we also save the data to the state, but it's a minor detail for it's mostly for convenience. And then we invoke the DSL send message, which emits an event for sending the message. And it sends this event to the networking module, which is um, mc.net. And the event contains the message that we want to send and the list of nodes to which we want to send this event, which is in this case, all nodes. So you can see that transformation from here to here, from the pseudocode to the actual code, in this case, it can be done almost mechanically, even though the actual code tends to be a little bit more verbose. And here is this slightly more complicated example. Here, um, uh, when a node receives some message, it checks some conditions. And if these conditions are satisfied, it um, creates a digital signature and sends it, sends it back to the leader. And this is something where Mir slightly differs from the pseudocode because creating a signature is an expensive operation. And recall that we want the protocol uh, implementation to be basically single threaded. So that's why we actually uh, create, uh, we do such heavy operations asynchronously. So instead of just creating a signature in place here and uh, sending it back to the leader, we um, send a request to the crypto module to create a signature for us. And eventually, the crypto module notifies us that the signature is ready, and only then we send it to the leader. So the moral here is that sometimes, for the sake of performance, we may actually take a single event handler in pseudocode and split it into several event handlers in MIR, but still, the transformation from here to here is still pretty simple. So that's which is the main goal here. And finally, there is a cool thing that uh, MIRDSL actually supports conditional handlers, which is fun because no other programming languages, no real programming languages support it. And, but it, it's actually quite common to use in white papers. So yeah. And yeah, let me just quickly show you that it actually runs, that it actually works. So this is a very toy application. As I said, it's a simple broadcast, which allows the first node, which is a leader, to send a single message to all other nodes, which are represented by the four terminals here. And they're just going to say, hello, protocol labs, for example. And yeah, as you can see, the message is delivered. And it is done through a Byzantine full tolerant um, algorithm. So the leader will not be able to equivocate. Okay, and finally, I'd like to mention that MIR is still work in progress. There are a lot of challenges that we need to address. For most of them, we sort of know how to address them, but we are still working on that. And I guess that's it from me to, for today. And you can also come and chat with us in MIRDEV uh, Slack channel on Filecoin Slack. Yeah, and uh, Sergey is going to present us, uh, present your testing infrastructure uh, in the next time. Thank you. So I, I'm go I'm gonna talk about reproducible integration testing in Mir. I'm Sergey Fedorov from Consensus Lab, one of the developers of Mir framework. 
And let me just quickly recap for completeness that the MIR is a framework to implement distributed protocols focus on, with focus on consensus protocols. It's made modular and flexible. You can find it here on GitHub. And it's a part of Consensus Labs Y3 project, which is also called Scalable Consensus. So the general architecture of MIR is uh, even uh, centric. So there are different modules that can produce and consume events. And basically, uh, the node operates by dispatching events from, from source to destination modules. And as any software, we would like to ensure uh, its stability and correctness by uh, proper testing. And uh, with uh, distributed protocols, and I think especially with consensus protocols, it's particularly uh, difficult. And uh, the consensus protocol is a critical part of any blockchain or uh, distributed system that uses that. So our goals with uh, when we do integration testing is to ensure stability against uh, different kinds of uh, failure, like uh, crashes, sorry, crashes, network partitioning, Byzantine failure, and we would also like to catch some implementation bugs. When we think about integration testing of a consensus protocol. It appears a good idea to have uh, such testing at deterministic, so that uh, if we get a, failure, a test failure in CI, then we can take uh, some kind of random seed and reproduce the test exactly, uh, the failure exactly, uh, so that we can debug it step by step. So to achieve that, we need to control uh, concurrency in the node and between the nodes. And we also would like to uh, to explore different schedules of execution so that we use pseudo-random uh, schedule, uh, the ability to run pseudo-random schedules so that we can catch different bugs. What prevents us from uh, achieving uh, reproducibility. So it's a uh, different kind of inherent sources of non-determinism. So this, this, the sources of non-determinism in our case is mostly communication between nodes over the network. It can come because of unpredictable message delays or unreliable message delivery or out of order message delivery. And uh, as well as communication between nodes, uh, we can also have uh, non-determinism within a node because uh, our uh, event dispatching between modules happens concurrently. And we also have a local clock in each node that can fire timeouts. So that is also non-deterministic. And when I'm talking about integration testing, I, I talk about a scenario where all nodes run on the same machine within even within the same process. So it's kind of, uh, they don't really have to communicate through network. They can communicate with some uh, stub. But nevertheless, uh, when we run several nodes, uh, we need to run them concurrently. And that concurrency gives us non-determinism that we want to uh, control. So how, how uh, we can uh, control that non-determinism? Uh, so our first trial and a step towards that is introducing a simulation engine uh, that uh, I recently implemented within the MIR framework. So uh, the, the core of this engine is the runtime. It uh, counts simulated time. So it simulates uh, time. Uh, it counts log logical time and uh, it executes actions that are scheduled uh, at specific points in this simulated time. So we can, uh, uh, the, so the simulation, the runtime knows at which instant of time any each action should happen. And the, ha the, the action 
itself happens as it were uh, instantaneous. And uh, this runtime, uh, it functions such that it executes all uh, the, the actions sh scheduled at the next, uh, well, it it executes the the shed the next scheduled action in the in the simulated timeline, and it waits until that scheduled action is complete, and then it knows that there is nothing more to execute at this time, and it can proceed to execute the next action scheduled uh, in the virtual time. It may be scheduled in two hours of virtual time, but uh, in our simulation, it happens to, as the next step immediately. This, this runtime has a notion of processes that can help us to control uh, concurrency. And uh, so it represents running actions within the runtime. So whenever an, an action uh, is executed, that is bound to a process that uh, becomes a runnable, it executes some code, and then it should go to, uh, to, to block on some operation or sleep uh, in virtual time, sleep in virtual time, so that uh, the action is complete and then the runtime can uh, proceed to the next action, to the next scheduled action. So processes can also spawn new active processes. Uh, they can virtually fork, like one process can spawn a new process and then both are active. And uh, until they both go to sleep, or block uh, the the simulation runtime doesn't execute the next action, and they can also synchronize and, and communicate with each other, and that is achieved by means of channels. This is the mechanism to synchronize and communicate values between processes. Right. So, how does it help to run mirror nodes uh, uh, in, in reproducible integration testing? Is that we wrap all modules uh, of, a no, of a mirror node, and we run uh, unmodified node core and also unmodified modules code, but we wrap modules so that we can get control of uh, module execution and event dispatching. So in our case, uh, handling of each event, uh, it happens as if it was instantaneous, but we can also introduce some uh, delays in virtual time, uh, pseudo-random delays in virtual time to simulate uh, modules uh, taking more time to execute. And since modules do not do, are not supposed to communicate with each other directly, only through the node, through the mirror node, through the core, that is perfectly fine because we have full control over uh, event dispatching and therefore we can schedule Module or modules uh, running uh, uh, with our simulation framework. The execution of modules it's uh, reflected as a simulation processes. Those processes that uh, that were mentioned in the previous slide, right? And uh, we track we track events that come out of the modules that are generated by the modules and that are consumed by the modules so that we know exactly what to expect from the from the module from from the core we know how how it dispatches events and then we uh, control concurrency through the simulation uh, runtime and we have to provide two substitutes before i mentioned that modules are not modified but uh, with two exceptions, one module is transport, which implements communication between nodes. And we provide a substitute for that module called sim transport that, uh, that uh, implements communication with the simulation channels instead of real network or Golang normal channels. And so that we can control messages passing between nodes uh, as well as the events uh, in each node. And uh, we also have a substitute for a local timer because obviously we, we cannot use real uh, system timer uh, if we run a simulated time. 
we also have to use the simulated time. And this, uh, since uh, Mir, in Mir, any uh, modules are not supposed to use system uh, timer directly, but instead they emit events targeting a timer module that can uh, install timers and uh, send back a specified event when the timer fires. And we provide an implementation, a substitute for this timer module that is connected to the simulation and uh, basically utilizes uh, the simulated simulation runtime uh, to implement this timer with uh, the virtual time. And the implementation of these parts that are specific to MIR are located here in package deploy test. But the simulation engine itself is located in package test sim. It's not really so coupled with MIR. It's kind of independent, right? And this, this uh, MIR specific stuff, it uses the simulation runtime uh, to, me, to, to, to work. Right, so this is the code and I would just run two, two integration tests, a number four and number 15. And the difference is that the number four uses real time and number 15 uses virtual time. So the test runs. And in the end, we will see uh, the difference in how much time does it take. So the number four, it's with real time, it takes 20 seconds because it has to wait all the timeouts. It has to wait all the uh, things in real time. And number 15 is the simulation time and it runs significantly faster. So it's good in CI and also it does not depend on this, uh, on how fast is the virtual machine running the test. We had some failures because uh, GitHub virtual machine in CI, it was sometimes a bit too slow. So real time doesn't really work reliably there. Whereas simulated time is just doesn't matter. It, uh, it simulates time. That That's all what I wanted to show. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for attending the mother of all demo days. And thank you to all of our presenters. Um, if you're interested in presenting next month, the next demo day will be September 1st. Um, if you have any questions for any of the presenters, feel free to reach out to them. Well, have a great day, guys.